I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Welcome back to VLGA Connect. It's time for the weekly TGU and I'm joined today by Tony Rannick from our sponsors Hunt and Hunt Lawyers to wander through some of the stories in the world of local government this week. Hi, Tony. Oh, it's, they just keep giving, Chris. Um, how are you? you? I'm well, thank you. What's your week been like? Yeah, a, a good, good, Chris. Um, another, another week um, off to, to do, doing some training at Wyndham Council uh, tomorrow, which is um, of offices just around conflicts of interest. But yeah, been a, been a, been another good week. And uh, Julie couldn't join us this week. Julie Reed, as she's uh, she's been joining us fairly regularly of late. Uh, she's doing some staff training, I think, at Darabin. Uh, which is uh, which is good to hear. Now, uh, we are recording this on Thursday. So if something really big breaks on Thursday afternoon or Friday morning and we don't talk about it, the reason is we've got no idea because uh, <laughs> we've recorded this ahead of time because of the big VLGA Fast Track Councillor Leadership Development Day, which is happening on Friday. And it's uh, going to be my pleasure to be emceeing that day and working with the team there at uh, at the VLGA. So, Tony, uh, there's been a couple of um, fairly major uh, reports out this week as far as the Victoria uh, sector is concerned. We'll get to the Horsham Municipal Monitors report in just a moment. But in terms of closing the loop, I noticed that the local government inspectorate has released the outcome of a review it conducted last year into some long-standing issues at West Wimmera Shire Council. And pleasing to note that the inspector's pleased with uh, how things are progressing there. Yeah, absolutely. So people will remember a report um, from the inspectorate back in, I think, November 2018. Um, some issues at West Wimmera, you know, around you know, things like governance, um, procurement, I think sale and lease of um, land, I think the Caniva Aerodrome came up, um, HR mm -hmm. management. Um, but there were a whole uh, range of things, weren't there? Yeah, a, quite mm -hmm. a long list. But um, good to see that my, Michael Stefanovic and, and, and the inspectorate have um, have um, commented on the progress, the excellent progress made there at West Wimmer and congratulations to the CEO, um, I think it's David Bezuidenhout. Oh, is that how you say it? I've been saying it wrong. Is it Bezuidenhout? No, Hout? you might be right. That's my <laughs> my attempt. But um, yeah. congratulations to David and his um, executive management team there. Um, yeah, certainly um, the um, indicators are that some really significant progress has been made and um, major improvements in the operations at West Wimmera. Yeah, clearly, uh, since David's arrival, they've moved the needle forward on those issues because as the re as the report uh, talks about, the original issues arose in 2011. Uh, mm. There was that uh, further report in 2018 identifying all of those issues that you've just outlined. And they also note that um, uh, uh, most of the improvement strategies didn't actually commence until 2021, three years after that 2018 Report, yeah, we, we, with COVID, I think had a big impact on sort of implementation of some mm. of those strategies and, and, and policies. But um, again, um, some some major progress, um, and um, rightly so, the inspectorate um, called that out and congratulated the uh, CEO and the executive management team there. Yeah, here, here, um, well done, and thanks to the inspectorate for keeping us informed mm. on that. It did cross my mind. I wondered how many outstanding sort of issues reports uh, in the system uh, with the, the inspectorate noting that they conducted that review in June of last year and we're nine months later to, to find out about their observations. I think there might be an indication of the workload. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now, the Municipal Monitor at Horsham Rural City Council has completed her term. That's Jude Holt. Uh, she submitted her final report to the Minister, I, I think about two months ago, and the Minister has released it this week, um, Minister Melissa Horn, that is, uh, just one recommendation that the minister's spoken about, which is to to run a community leadership program. That there, are, I think there are a few observations in the report from Ms. Holt that are worth touching on, Tony. Yeah, absolutely. There, there were certainly um, observations that that she said. Look, certainly prior to her arrival, um, that she felt the council is just reviewing um, the the audio and, and video of council meetings had. Had at times behaved disrespectfully, uh, you know, towards each other, and and she has commented on on a perhaps a, 
a lack of experience of counsellors in particularly in relation to the um, important role in it's reviewing the performance of the CEO on an annual basis yeah. um, and the challenge for for counsellors who, who who lack that sort of business experience and also that Horsham um, has been one of those councils where there's been I think a history as she's as as the monitor said of low candidate um, mm. numbers at elections and as you you mentioned one of her recommendations in order to to tackle that is for there, there to be this community leadership program that uh, is really an effort to identify and um, encourage candidates for the forthcoming um, 2024 election cycle. Uh, a couple of takeaways for me from it, Tony. Um, uh, Ms Holt uh, does say that the Council of Behaviour improved, uh, I think, significantly. I'm not sure if that's the word she used, but an overall improvement of behaviour during her term, given those concerns about um, how the council laws were uh, working together. Um, she makes, as you say, uh, comments about the capacity of the council group to manage the CEO employment relationship. And coupled with that are some recommendations about a broader role for the independent person who, as I read it, currently assists with the review and the objective setting, not so much uh, if they had to go through a recruitment and selection process. And she notes that it is the year of the CEO's uh, contract coming up. That's uh, Sunil Bella. And um, she's also uh, recommended some best practice guidelines be developed by the government. And I was interested to see the minister's silent on this around uh, the reporting of councillor related costs to provide more full line of sight of those costs. And it, it, it's in a paragraph about the audit and risk committee. And I note the link to what we, we've spoken about recently, some councillors calling for a change to the way childcare expenses are reported. And given that's a touchy topic at the moment, uh, Tony, I wonder whether that's why the minister hasn't gone there in terms of making any comment at this point. Yeah, could, could, could be, could be so, um, there, Chris. Um, I'm sort of one for transparency on these things, but uh, as it would appear that the monitor is is um, proposing. So I did ask the minister the question about the childcare expenses and that transparency issue she speaks about in a, a special address that we've had to record for the LGA fast track tomorrow because the minister's been called to Canberra for an important meeting. So people in the room will get to hear her thoughts on that. And then we can perhaps talk about that post, post uh, the event. Uh, so that's the Municipal Monitor's report from Horsham. Uh, there's a Darabin report outstanding, uh, I believe. Just trying to think where else we've got monitors in place. Wodonga, uh, don't be believe we've had a final report there. So um, most of those terms, I think, were due to conclude in January. So I'm just assuming the reports are in and the Minister will release them when uh, when they feel it's appropriate to do so. Yeah, watch that space. Some of those councils um, still have council of conduct panel matters progressing. To, I would say. Which could be a factor, you reckon, mm. in the yeah. uh, the timing of the release of any of those reports. Okay. A uh, quick note that the by-election at Mornington Peninsula Shire has been uh, held and uh, declared. Kate Roper is the new councillor there in Watson Ward. Now, the reason that's uh, happened is Paul Mercurio being elected to state parliament and because of the electoral structure there in that particular ward, they needed to run a by-election rather than uh, the whole uh, list of countbacks that have already occurred in those other council areas where councillors have uh, been elevated to state parliament. Now, Tony, uh, you, I know you caught uh, this story during the week and it was um, uh, raising some interesting um, parallels, perhaps, yeah. for local government. This was about Service Australia and the Synergy 360 contract decision, a report in the age. Yeah, that's right. So um, Services Australia are an, are an executive arm of the Commonwealth Government. They used to be called, you know, D DHS, Department of Human Services. Prior to that, we knew them as the DSS, you know, Department of Social Security. Um, services Australia in the news because um, a, an employee, uh, an officer of um, Services Australia um, has been uh, called out, in, at least in, in the article, uh, about having um, uh, attended the home of a director of Synes Synergy 360, which is mm -hmm. a, a consulting firm, um, attending the home for drinks or dinner of, of uh, a director of that consulting firm at the same time that the public servant 
uh, was had some involvement in a decision about um, potentially um, uh, appointing clients of Synergy 360 right. um, to you know procurement arrangements at um, at the at at Services Australia. So that, of course, um, in a local government context, um, might give rise to a conflict of interest and cause me to to think about. Um, these provisions in a local government context because we're talking here about close friendships mm. rather than sort of family relationships. So, of course, as we know in the, the, the Local Government Act, we've got um, the provisions around a material conflict of interest and, and those provisions deal with um, where an affected person can be either the, the officer or councillor making the decision where they have a personal interest in an outcome, but also can be, you know, a family member, a spouse, you know, business partner of that officer or councillor. So that's the material conflict. But then we have this um, notion of a general conflict of interest yes. where, you know, a reasonable, impartial person would think that the councillor or the council officer's um, personal interests might conflict with their public duty and that's where I think um, we have you know um, you know related circumstances because that's where I think a close friendship might actually become relevant and so you know my rule of thumb if you like with this mm. is 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 and it's nowhere none of this is in the legislation but really from the case law is that you know, if if you're a, a councillor or a council officer and you're likely to be involved in a decision that um, the other party who stands to gain or lose from that decision is someone that you might have around to your house for drinks, you might go to their house for dinner, to me that's a big alarm bell ringing that your relationship with that person is so close that a reasonable person would say, you know, how can Councillor Tony, how can Officer Chris make an impartial decision mm -hmm. about that close associate that they'd have round to their house for dinner, who's not a family member, yeah. who isn't a business partner, who isn't a spouse. But you can see how people struggle with uh, whether something crosses the line or not in those grey areas, can't you? Because as you say, it's not in the legislation. It's mm. more in the perception as well as what is considered reasonable. I mean, you could go to the the far extremes of this and rule out anyone you've ever met uh, mm. as a reason for not being involved in the decision. But how practical is that? Yeah. And, and that's why I say, I don't say it's someone you've had a coffee with or, or someone that, you know, um, you, you regularly deal with so that you call them by their first name and you mm. you, you know what, um, you know, a bit about their personal life. So when you see them, you ask about how their dog is or how their football team's going. Well, and why that wouldn't that might... be in the legislation, Tony? Why wouldn't those sorts of things be in there? <laughs> yeah. So to me, that's that's just not enough yeah. of a close association to, mm. to, to bring about a conflict. But certainly to me, someone you would have over for dinner, drinks, you might go away on holidays with. Well, yeah. um, that's mm. clearly, to me, suggesting such a close um, connection mm. that um, a reasonable objective person looking in might have some concerns about your ability to put that association aside and make a, a purely impartial decision. So we should note, uh, according to the Age report, that uh, th this review that has come out into uh, this particular issue found uh, no actual evidence of misconduct by any public servant. But there have been questions raised about the extent of the review. Some whistleblowers weren't interviewed. Um, uh, some of the relationships, the personal relationships, weren't examined, apparently, according to the story. So whether there will be a sequel to this or not as a result of those concerns that are being raised remains to be seen. Yeah, one to watch, I think, Chris. Thanks, Tony. Let's whip through uh, a couple of interesting ones from interstate. Uh, just to note that uh, we've we've talked a bit about the major reforms going on in Western Australia to the system of local government there, and the first tranche has come in, or it's come through the uh, the lower house of parliament at least, 
uh, last week. That means uh, directly elected mayors for the larger councils in Western Australia, the introduction of optional preferential voting. Here's an interesting one, Tony. It's going to be mandatory for a CEO's performance indicators and results to be published publicly on an annual basis. Yeah, I, I did see that, Chris. I, I did see in the report itself that there were, or, or in the, you know, the um, reporting about this um, legislation, that there were going to be limited exemptions to that for sensitive matters. And I didn't quite um, understand what particularly would, was going to qualify as a sensitive mm. matter. But it would be, um, I'm not aware of um, a similar provision in Australia at the moment, this requirement to, to publish the outcomes of those um, you know, performance review or KPI um, type reviews of CEO performance. And um, I think that'll be, again, if, if that um, legislation passes through the upper house as well and becomes law in WA, it'll be a really interesting one for us to watch in terms of how that plays out um, in circumstances where you might have a council group who um who who aren't as as happy with the performance of their CEO and we're seeing you know published um numbers that are quite low or or or, or yeah. maybe the the corollary of that is an organization where you know the councillors are um are, are, are scoring their, their CEO highly and yet the community feels that the council perhaps isn't performing up to the the, the right standard. You've hit the nail on the head. I had all those uh, same thoughts and uh, it, it, it'll be more than interesting to see how that plays out. I'm not aware of that happening in any other jurisdiction either. Generally, the CEO's performance review and all of the uh, related information would be dealt with uh, confidentially uh, as the Act allows. Mm. Uh, so uh, as we say, one to watch. Uh, there's also talk about monitors and a, and a local government inspectorate being introduced. That's in a second tranche of reforms that are currently under consultation in Western Australia. How about this one, Tony? The Deputy Mayor of the Sunshine Coast Council has been denied a request to go to the Netherlands on a public study tour, um, in, in my view, mainly because uh, he wanted the council to sign off on $21,000 in business class airfares. Chris, you'd always fly first class, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Right down the back. Right down the back, Tony. <laughs> You're like me, Chris. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I, I did think it was um, um, a really um, interesting request. Um, I think that the councillor in question, Councillor Rick Babarowski, um, said that uh, you know he, he wanted to fly business class to the Netherlands for his study tour on public transport because uh, he would otherwise get um, such jet, jet lag that he wouldn't be able to perform um, to the sufficient capacity in, in that um, study tour. Um, $21,000 is, um, you know, a lot of money for one study tour for any one councillor. And um, surprise, surprise, the, um, the, the council voted eight to two against supporting... Mm that um, allocation of funds, but um, you might be right. It might be he's um, dwelling on the, you know, the, the the business class airfares rather than the actual um, nature of the, the tour and what the outcomes would be for council that have and actually evaluate. done in this time and um, you know, yeah. got the necessary support. I, I didn't hear the debate, but the ABC story, which we'll uh, pop a link up for, um, uh, most of it seemed to be around the need for those business class airfares. So ultimately, I think that's what uh, did it in. Um, and he was approached for comment uh, by the ABC and he decided not to provide comment, said he'd prefer to move on. I can understand that. I think so. <laughs> what about this one, Tony? In Florida, a mayor has quit and walked out in the middle of a council meeting uh, to the shock of all that were there, this is uh, the city of uh, Clearwater, uh, which is a five-member council. So the other four were sit there, uh, sat there scratching their heads for about 10 minutes, apparently, when the mayor quite seriously said, I don't think I'm the right person for this role anymore, picked up his stuff and and left and followed up with a formal resignation, I assume, because he's gone. It's been an in interesting 10-minute recess where yes. those remaining councillors got together and said, oh, what do we do now? And presumably, um, 
yeah, at least had to choose a, a chairperson for the remainder of the meeting yeah. um, and potentially, you know, um, be selecting a, a, a mayor, a new mayor going forwards. But I, I do um, have an update on that. We'll come to that in Oh, okay. In a okay. Well, yeah. um, I, I wonder whether this has happened um, in in uh, Victoria or in, in an Australian context where a mayor has, um, you know, thrown the towel in or, or you know, resigned halfway through uh, a public meeting. I can imagine there would be situations where some mayors have, have, have wanted to do that. They or probably felt, felt um, like they wanted to, yes. Frustrated <laughs> enough to um, express a desire that you know, they're thinking about doing that, but I'm not aware of it actually happening in the midst of a meeting. But um, chances are it probably has happened at some stage, Chris. Hopefully someone can let us know if that's the case. I've had a few people comment to me about it, so I think it's uh, it's extraordinary enough uh, to catch people's attention that this mayor, Frank Hibbard, uh, basically quit on the spot and left in the middle of a meeting. Now, the update is, as of this week, the council has found a new mayor. So under the system, they must be able to appoint from uh, beyond. Uh, and they've gone to uh, someone who held the mayoralty some years ago, I think up to about 20 14 uh, for the term for the remainder of the term that's uh, that's to come which I, I think is less than a year so they've uh, they've co-opted someone in to to uh, to take the mayoral role for that period of time you couldn't do that uh, in Victoria at least uh, you'd have to select from within or if you had no um, if you had a vacancy obviously you've got to fill it somehow yeah. that, that's right and and look to you know to to counsel a Hibbard some um, you know, to, just to his credit, I suppose he 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 had served as the mayor for about ten years in, at, right. at various yeah. stages since I think two thousand and five or something. So he's been he's he's he's, he's certainly put in put in um, the the years in that role, and uh, it seems to have um, got to a point where he's um, decided that um, enough's enough, and it's better for the yeah. council and and himself that he moves on. It was a, he did provide some context later. It was all over a, a particular project, a high value project that he felt represented reckless spending on the part of the council, but he was the only one obviously that had that view. So he decided better to not be there. And I think it's a directly elected role, which was, sort of explains how you can then uh, co-op someone into it. All right, uh, we'll pop the link up for that as well. If anyone wants to have a look, there's a short video on the USA Today page that uh, will show you the actual moment that it happened. Let's have a couple of picks of the week before we wrap up, Tony. Yours is from Adelaide. Yeah, yeah, from, from the beautiful city of Adelaide. And those of us of a certain age, Chris, will remember the um, classic Australian movie Breaker Morant. Edward um, Woodward. Jack Thompson, Edward Woodward, you're right. Um, mm -hmm. Brian Brown. Um, 1980 that came out, mm. but um, of course, Breaker Morant being, um, I, I didn't realise he was a South Australian, but certainly an, an, an Australian um, serviceman in the Boer War in, in Africa in um, um, the early 1900s. He um, was ultimately um, court-martialed and executed um, by the mm. British Army, who he was serving with for um, allegedly, um, I think, um, executing Boer prisoners. And that's, you know, the movie's mm. very much about that story. Mm. But what has occurred recently in Adelaide, um, according to the media report this week, is that there have been representations from, from Mr Morant's family um, for his name to be added to the Boer War Memorial that's very prominent in Adelaide. I think it's on the corner of King William Street, and North Terrace, um, mm. and um, for his name to be added to that memorial. And of course, the controversy being, you know, is he a, a war criminal is, uh, or was he just another um, Australian who, who actually did serve um, in, in that war and his name perhaps um, ought, ought be up on the, on the, on the plaque as well. Um, council um, did, I think, perhaps the clever thing, but they, in that they called for a report. Um, so we're waiting to hear um, um, what ultimately, ultimately the decision is. I believe Breaker Morant isn't the only um, service person who, um, you know, uh, Australian from Adelaide who, 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 who served in the Boer War, whose name isn't on that, that memorial. Um, so, so it may not just be his name being added, maybe others, but of course, 
a lot of controversy about yeah. Drake and Morant, um, you know, and, and a lot of, some of us, um, I think, I might have even had to watch that movie when I was in school. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 1980, yes. <laughs> just trying to think, I think I probably avoided that uh, <laughs> just just slightly. Um, yeah, so this has been going on for a while, obviously, and uh, they're calling for a quick decision on this. Has there been any response that you've noted from the city council to that request? So, so yeah, council council laws have called for a report from the council about the um, about the protocols and the implications of doing this. Um, we we there, interestingly, there's a a body that is um, represents um, you know Australian servicemen, and I think there's a there's a um, or service people, and there's a um, also a body that is um, um, represents. Um, Descendants from the from the Boer War, uh, people who fought in the Boer War, and a number of um, these bodies have come out and 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 condemned the idea. Mm. Um, but obviously, there's um, it's a bit like Ned Kelly. There's a mm. sort of a mixed view about um, Breaker Morant, who's um, has become you know a bit of a um, a, a bit of a historical figure yep. maybe yeah. even someone that people look back fondly at because of that movie i, more, I think more in, infamous perhaps than yeah than famous uh and of course immortalized in song by the great john williamson you'd know, oh, that, but, so, you, you don't know that song, I, 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 once i heard rip rip wood chip i just, <laughs> just, just, just declared i'd never listen to another john williamson song oh, it, don't don't uh don't judge him by that one song is all I'd say. Um, and look, my pick of the week, I, I've debated about whether to do this. Uh, hopefully people won't be offended for uh, for me highlighting this story out of Saskatchewan in Canada, where really this is to highlight how councillors sometimes can be caught by surprise and blindsided by things that have been done within their organisations without, they say, their knowledge. In this case, uh, councillors in the city of Regina, what this has done, uh, Tony, has confirmed for me the correct way to say the name of that city. The mm. city of uh, Regina has developed a tourism campaign that councillors turned up to the launch of, uh, only to be um, somewhat surprised and concerned by uh, the slogans, uh, slogans such as the city that rhymes with fun and show us your Regina. Uh, this has got international attention, Tony. Uh, the Washington Post, the BBC have talked about it. Um, the council approved the funding for it, but they weren't briefed beforehand, and now they're not so sure. And I think there's a rethink happening. Yeah, absolutely. Councillors have said they've been, they were embarrassed um, and, um, and you know, they want the people behind this campaign held accountable. Mm. And um, the campaign's off. Um, the the, the potentially, you know, offensive slogans and that have been removed. Um, I think, I think, I saw a clip that I think Mick Jagger um, from the Rolling Stones was the one who, who, who started sort of making a comment about Regina when he was on a, you know, on a tour there, mm. and um, and that that had been picked up by the um, people behind the campaign and thought, you know, there's something in this that's um, memorable. We're gonna. We're going to use this, but <laughs> so as you say, the, um, the councillors weren't weren't amused, and um, and uh, you know when it was finally floated with them, I think quite late in the piece, or yeah. even when the campaign had already commenced, um, they certainly um, put an end to it very very swiftly. And um, so, at the very least, I guess Regina has um, got some, you know, some big big publicity here and we we yeah. here we are talking about it yeah. um a place in saskatchewan canada over here in australia and um people know where it is and as you say how to pronounce it now so it, look it just underscores the need to go through a proper risk assessment process yes. when you're developing any project you know in this case you know they've lost the support of the elected bottle body who say they are bearing the brunt of the public outrage uh the slogans are sexist and counterproductive to the city's work on addressing sexual violence against women and i'd say yes 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 to all of those things be very careful what you wish for when you think you're being a bit cute and um and and funny perhaps in the name of promotions no oh, good good pick up chris you, you your um your knowledge of local government across the, the globe <laughs> astounds me every week 
<laughs> no, I do a lot of reading for the local government news roundup, uh, Tony, you know, and uh, that story will feature in uh, in the next edition of the the podcast as well. All right, that's uh, all we had for this week. Anything else you want to share before we move on down the road? No, Chris, um, I'm, I'm back in, um, I think I'm um, off to uh, Borbor Shire next uh-huh. week again. Um, so that'll, that'll be a bit of fun. And um, we're spending some time with the councillors there. And um, um, so, yeah, another, and then, and of course, we've got Easter. Yes, so, next um, week. I don't know Can't whether believe. we're doing a show next week. We we haven't even talked about that because uh, Easter's going to get in the way of our normal recording schedule. Uh, be surprised, like the rest of us, if we turn up uh, on uh, on Good Friday. Somehow, I doubt it, Tony. Maybe we we've earned the week off. Um, so. We've got uh, VLGA Fast Track tomorrow, uh, probably today, or or it was yesterday, as you uh, are listening to or watching this with some terrific guests, including Julia Banks. The former MP Adam Fennessy, currently the Dean and CEO at uh, Anzog. We've got Kathy Henderson and Ali Wasty, local government CEOs. Peter Singer, a master in conflict resolution. It's a fabulous lineup, and I know the group uh, in the room, which is sold out by the way, pretty much, uh, are going to get a lot of value from it. And we can talk about hopefully things that come from it in future editions. Thanks, awesome. Tony. Thanks a lot, Chris. You have a great week. You too, and a good Easter if we don't see you uh, next week. That's Tony Rannick from Hunt and Hunt Lawyers, sponsors of TGU, which comes to you from VLGA Connect every week, well, most weeks, uh, on YouTube and on your podcast player. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. 